I'm Genevieve Tompkins and I'm the project officer for the Rare Invertebrates in the Cairngorms Partnership Project and I'm going to talk to you about the contributions of the curious. So what do I mean by that? Well um, I love invertebrates, I think they're amazing and so do loads of other people fortunately. They're cute like this little spider up in the corner, very very cute, very very beautiful, the butterflies and dragonflies of the world, these stunning massive hoverflies, the great pile hoverfly. They're all so weird so you've got things like this hazel leaf roller down the bottom here so they just cover everything to, from the weird to sublime the lot and they also interact with each other and the world in fascinating ways so you can just lose a whole afternoon watching some of these invertebrates going about their daily lives. And then the other thing about invertebrates which I think is brilliant is that they're massively inclusive so it doesn't matter where you live, how much access you've got to green space, so you don't have to have a massive forest, a huge expanse of moorland or any of those things to engage with invertebrates. You will find invertebrates in the tiniest of gardens, you'll find them in parks in the middle of cities, you'll find them living in the buildings, living on the walls of buildings and everywhere. Um, so they're massively inclusive. It doesn't matter where you live, how much time you've got to give, you know, you can just spend a couple of minutes in your lunch break watching um, a solitary bee going in and out of um, its nest in, in the walls of a building or something like that. And that's just a magical bit of time spent. So insects are amazing, invertebrates are amazing, um, but how do we go from engaging with them and finding them fascinating and just loving spending time watching them, how do we take that curiosity and turn it into more of a contribution? Well, the way that you can do that is by sharing what you find, by sending in your records and by sharing observations. And that takes all of these individual magical moments with invertebrates, these exciting discoveries, um, these weird observations, and it turns them into something that can be useful for many more people and it can contribute to science and to our knowledge of natural history. So I do know quite a few people who are really interested in invertebrates and many of them do send in records, but many of them also don't. And some of that's just um, just because they just don't really. Um, they know about invertebrate recording or they know about biological recording, but just haven't got around to doing it. Um, and, but for a lot of people, for a surprising number of people, biological recording is still not really something that they know about. And so, um, and so this talk today really is just to introduce those who aren't already familiar with or know anything about biological recording, what powerful um, a tool it can be in turning these observations that the curious amongst us make and turning that into a contribution to science. Um, and, and also to encourage those who do know about it but don't yet engage that fully with it, um, to encourage those people to engage and, and maybe find new ways of engaging with it as well. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is putting rarities on the map. Now, um, now this is something that um, you can do formally, so through organisations um, or through projects like the Rare Invertebrates in the Cairngorms. Um, so you can take part in, in set-up surveys that are specifically aimed at picking up rarities and mapping their distribution. Um, so this can be things like the Kentish Glory Moth, which is one of our Rick species that our volunteers have together managed to find more than 80 new one kilometre square 
records or sites for this species in the Cairngorms National Park and nearby areas. It can be things like the pine hoverfly, um, so here's a larval pine hoverfly, um, and a big contribution that also can actually be made through sharing your observations um, is also with the community that you live in and um, through your local contacts because it's things like the pine hoverfly where the more people who know what these things look like, um, the larvae but also the adults, the more likely it is um, that people will recognise one when they see it. And then equally, the more people share the word about sharing these records, sending them in, the more that um, that the more people in in a landscape, in a community who do see things will then share that information and it will become known to uh, the wider recording community and scientific world. Um, so, so there's a, a role there in terms of actually sending your own records in, but also encouraging others to do the same. And then the small scabious mining bee. This is a species whose Scottish stronghold was previously thought to be around sort of Dundragon area, um, but through the work of the rare invertebrates and the Cairngorms and all our volunteers, um, it's now known that the stronghold at the moment at least is Strath's Bay because we have found many, many more um, sites for this bee in Strath's Bay and, um, and again there's a big role as ambassadors to start talking to people about the importance of these flower rich meadows that the bees need. Um, so putting rarities on the map um, formally for another example of this, we can look at the northern silver stiletto fly. Um, it's a fly which blends in very well with its habitat. So you've got a mating pair here and this one here um, on the right is a female with uh, black um, markings on the abdomen. And then you've got a male on the left there who hasn't got those black markings on his abdomen. But you can see that they're both that kind of silvery colour and it blends in beautifully with the shingle habitat on which they live. Um, so this is some river shingle at Feshi Fans. And shingle habitat is, is vulnerable and also um, really uh, misunderstood or underappreciated. Um, and the shingle that this fly seems to prefer is quite mature shingle that you can see here. You've got these banks of sand where you've got sandy deposits here that the, the larval fly lives in and is a predator. And then you've also got shelter created by trees and deadwood. Um, which create these really warm, sunny hot spots. And then you've also got flowering plants for the adult flies to feed on. And this fly is a Scottish biodiversity list species, and it's also on the Cairngorms Nature Action Plan. And through the work of the volunteers in the Rare Invertebrates in the Cairngorms project, we've managed to find 19 new one kilometre square sites for this fly so far. Um, and this has been partly expanding the known distribution for the fly, so pushing eastwards further um, along the Dee and also pushing south down to the Spital of Glen Shee, down to the area around Blair Athol. Um, but the other great thing about this um, work by volunteers is that they've really explored a lot of the tributaries of um, big important rivers like the Spey and found that these tributaries are as important, if not slightly more important even potentially, than the main rivers for this fly. Um, so as well as providing information on the expansion of the um, range of the fly or, or at least finding out more where it's found, it's also providing more detailed information as well about exactly which sorts of shingle bank um, it needs and, and where in the landscape we can find that. The great thing about um, about taking part in more formal uh, projects or um, recording um, surveys and so on is that you don't have to be an expert to engage with that. There's um, training workshops, training ID guides, all sorts of things are provided. So, um, so you don't have to be an expert, but also if you do already know um, some invertebrate groups, it can be a nice way of bringing yourself into a new group um, or a new habitat type that you've not experienced before. Um, so there's lots of reasons why it's really um, a good experience to get involved with some of these groups. Um, group surveys and the other thing is it can be really social as well so you can meet up with people who are as interested in invertebrates as you are and go out and find them which is all sorts of fun. So you can also though contribute um, to putting rarities on the map in your sort of own spare time outside of taking part in a big survey or project. So this is for example um, when you're just out on walks or just in your garden even um, or it can be when you are taking part in a bigger project or, or survey but things that you find incidentally whilst you're taking part in it. So for example Santa Johnson he's um, the shining guest and species champion in Rich 
Dick. Um, so he spends a lot of time with his dad, Ross, going out and looking at wood ant nests for shiny guest ants that live within those wood ant nests. Um, so Ross and Xander could just um, focus directly down on the shiny guest ants and not worry too much about whatever else is around. But they don't. Um, they look at all the other things that are interacting with that wood ants nest as well, um, which is brilliant because not that many people actually spend all that much time staring at wood ants nests and it's amazing what you can find when you do um so so this is um from this is a little still here from Xander's youtube um channel which i advise go and have a look at because he's got some fantastic videos on there but this is a video of when he found a silky gallows spider Diapena torva, which is a near threatened species, also on the Scottish biodiversity list. So the brilliant thing about this is not only was Xander and Ross open to looking at what else was around when they were carrying out this survey, but they also shared that record. And that's really the key thing is the sharing of these observations and these things that, that are found, because um, records of this spider do not come in that often at all. And, you know, it's a rare spider and it's really important that we build more data up about where it's found um, and the kinds of sites it's found on. And this can only be done when people go and observe it and send their records in. Another example of this is the cow wheat shield bug. So this is a shield bug that I found uh, this spring in a woodland. I was in the woodland originally, um, or specifically, to be looking for pine hoverfly larvae, but um, spotted this little shield bug on this tree stump. And it turns out to be um, only the eighth record of this species in Scotland and the first record for over 30 years. So it's a really important record in terms of putting a rarity on the map. It's a site it's not been found in before, but I didn't go into that woodland expecting to find something really rare other than the pine hoverfly. Um, it was just an incidental thing and it's just by spotting these little things when you're out and about, but then importantly by sharing that with the wider community that they can they can start really contributing to our knowledge of, um, of natural history on these islands. Another example, and this one I'm putting in um, because I really want to emphasise the fact that you don't have to be an expert to contribute really important um, rare species data. It, it can be anyone who can do this um, as long as you're curious enough and, then that, and you share that contribution that you've um, made with the wider community. So there's a genus of caddis fly called Melana and there's Melana albicans, which is a species found predominantly in Scotland, um, parts of Wales and a couple of locations in England. And then there's Melana angustata, which is found in England and Wales, but not found at all in Scotland. Um, these two species look identical, so you have to dissect them down a microscope in order to tell them apart. Um, but in 2014, I found Melana angustata at Inch Marshes. Um, so I mean, one of the reasons that I found this unexpected record is because I didn't really know anything. I was very new to invertebrate recording, didn't really know that much about uh, the distribution of any species, um, how likely it was that something would be in a certain place, what certain things looked like, and all the rest of it. So essentially, I set a moth trap, collected up the caddis flies, and looked down all of them at, down a microscope. Um, but this is where being green can sometimes be really helpful, because if I had known that there was these two species of Melana and one was generally found in England and Wales and one was found more in Scotland, then it's possible that I might have been, well, that's Melana albicans, pop you out, off you go. But instead, because I didn't know this, I looked at it down the microscope and found it was the other species. So sometimes being green and not an expert and not having those preconceptions can actually be really, really helpful. Um, so don't think that just because you're not an expert, your contribution is unwanted, it is very, very much wanted. And sometimes it can be um, a complete non-expert, a new person to an arena who finds these big new things. Trends and responses. So this is sort of going to the other end of the scale, really, and talking about recording and sharing your observations of very common species, um, either within their known distribution or at the edge of their range. So things like the willow emerald damselfly, which appeared in the UK quite recently, or the holly blue butterfly, which is a reasonably common um, species in the UK. Um, but which more recently has been found to be appearing in um, northeast Scotland and moving up towards the Moray coast and it's only because people are recording this otherwise quite common species at the edge of its range that this expansion is being observed. Um, 
as much as recording things at the edge of their range is really important, recording them within their range, even if they're common, can be really important as well. And it, it actually can be more informative sometimes than recording rare um, species. So you've got things like the blood vein moth over here. This is a quite a common species found often uh, around houses. This picture was taken in my mother-in-law's house um, where they often used to come in. And so it can be one of those species that you sort of get used to seeing quite frequently coming into the house and, and sort of don't bother sending in the records. But because we have because it is a common species, because it is the ability to get this strong baseline of data for it, there is the potential to get actually really important informative data on this species of moth. And in fact, it's been found to be declining since 1968 and by 73%, which is massive. Um, but if we hadn't had those records coming in of what is quite a common species, then this just would not have been picked up. Equally, a black data dragonfly here. This species is locally common in upland areas um, down south, places like Dartmoor. Um, and the British Dragonfly Society's State of Dragonflies report that they released this year has shown that this species is declining. And if we didn't have those annual records of this species within places where it is thought to be common or has been common in the past, this just wouldn't have been picked up. And then finally, the stag beetle, that's another example of a species um, that's now declining across Europe and within the UK, it's, its range has really contracted. But if we didn't have those records from its range, we wouldn't be picking up that contraction. And, and equally, if we don't go on to continue collecting and pushing people to send in their records of stag beetles rather than just going, wow, that's a stag beetle, that's amazing, which is brilliant. But to take that and then send the record on is even more powerful because then we're getting more information on how the stag beetle is doing. Is it contracting even more? Is it expanding in certain places slightly as deadwood gets put in? What's happening with it? So records um, being sent in of things that you see commonly when you're just out and about is as valuable of records of rare things that you come across as well. A final example, which is quite relevant for the northeast of England, is a small red-eyed damselfly. Uh, this is a species that appeared in the UK back in 1999 and spread very rapidly in um, a sort of area down in the southeast and then has been continuing to spread slowly as far as County Durham now, um, so more slowly northwards and westwards. And because we've got really excellent information through the British Dragonfly Society of this species from people sending in, in their records and their observations of seeing the species, both within an area where where it's now thought to be much more common and along the edge of the range, they've actually been able to, um, to track climate models using this species, which is it seems to be expanding very much in line with, with the climate warming models. So you can do some really interesting things with these records of common species or species moving into new areas um, if you've got that data. Piecing things together. So this is less about putting things on the map and more about collecting wider ecological information about how these species live, their interactions with the environment and with one another. So there's a lot of discovery to be made in the world of invertebrates. There's loads of scope to find new things out. And, um, and any of us can contribute to that just by recording things using sound, uh, vision, whatever, and sending it in and sharing it with the wider community to be looked at. So this is things like different life stages. So you've got an egg laying longhorn beetle here. It's larval stages, which are, are really, uh, there's so much room to discover things within the larval stages of a lot of these species. Um, egg and pupil stages, it's interactions between each other. So you've got the interactions um, here between ants and aphids, but there's all sorts of different interactions between species as well. Um, and it's also um, just providing uh, providing images and so on that people can use to go on and do recording themselves. So, for example, from Rick, um, this is a picture of a shining guest ant that Peter Stronach, one of our volunteers, took last year. And this shining guest ant is up a tree, which is an extremely unusual observation. And if Peter um, hadn't firstly spotted that the ants were actually moving up the tree following the wood ant trails and secondly taken a photograph of that and shared it with the wider community that would have been an observation that would have been lost um, but instead he did do those things and and that was shared um, and equally our volunteers through doing their monitoring work of these ants nests have started to pick up the observation that the shining guest ants seem to be on the surface of the nest more frequently when um, it's slightly cooler so the beginning and end of the day um, and also 
when you've got some cloud cover. So it's possible that this is because they want to interact less when the um, wood ants are busiest on the surface of the nest. Um, we don't know, it might turn out to be a false observation, but because our volunteers are spotting this and then sharing that, we can build up a picture of the kinds of things that are worth looking into um, with the interactions of these species. <coughs> And another example here, so Patrick Cook um, spotted these Kentish Glory eggs on Alder at Deeside. Um, now, Kentish Glory are um, predominantly used young birches for their eggs and caterpillars. Um, so this observation of them on Alder is really unusual. It's known that they've used Alder down at Rannoch before, but this is the first observation of this within the Cairngorms National Park. And again, you know, Patrick, um, who he does work for butterfly conservation but he was in fact on holiday at this time and he spotted this Kentish glory followed it through spotted these egg laying um, the egg laying behavior in these eggs and then shared that with the wider community and, and and so now that we've got this observation that more people know about rather than it just being something someone spotted and then sort of forgot about um images are really important to share uh, a lot of people who are involved with invertebrate recording will know that it's really taken off a lot more recently partly in response to the fact that many more um, ID guides and um, microscope helps and all sorts have been created and we've got images now many more images and good quality images of these species that people can use um, when they're going out in the field and looking for things themselves and this is important for projects like Rick as well um, because we are often training up new volunteers who aren't familiar with a certain species um, or species group and um, to do that we need really good um, photographs. So this is a photograph of some xylota larvae, um, it's a genus of hoverfly and these do crop up in the rot holes that we look for pine hoverfly larvae in and they do look really quite similar to pine hoverfly larvae but we didn't have a photograph of them. So last year we went and got a photograph of them and this could be used to um, go towards our pine hoverfly identification information for volunteers. So previously we had um, pine hoverfly on there, we had Myothropa fluoria and Cacalotra rufa, but it was missing this um, section for xylota, which is really important because volunteers will come across this and, it, and if they don't know to look out for it, then it could easily be confused for a pine hoverfly. So just providing images of species or um, life stages that we don't yet have images of is really helpful. Another example of this is this northern robberfly. And again, this is an example of where you don't have to be an expert in order to contribute in this way. So I took this photograph of these northern robberflies on uh, Feshi fans this summer, but I didn't recognise the significance of that at all at the time. I didn't know what species it was. I just took a picture of it uh, and went and identified it afterwards. And, um, and it turns out that this seems to be the first photo of this species of a live specimen from the UK. Now that's really helpful because now we've got an image of this species that's taken in the UK that people can then use um, to help with identifying their own robber flies and it might be that this species turns up more frequently when we've got better um, images and identification information to go on. It doesn't just have to be images, you can also um, provide new information through other mediums such as sound. So Peter Stronach, who's our species champion for the small scabious mining bee on RIC, he actually pops some tiny microphones into the entrances of small scabious mining bee females nest holes. So here's a small scabious mining bee coming out of a nest hole. He popped these microphones in um, and he managed to get the sound of a small scabious mining bee. Oh, is it going to work? Hopefully you heard that. So that, that was the sound of a small scabious mining bee female within her nest. And we think what she was probably doing was offloading pollen there. Um, and now as well as being really, really cool and quite cute, that's also really useful because now we're starting to think, well, actually, can we use this sort of method of recording sound to work out things like how long females spend within their nest, how frequently they come back to their nest holes, um, information like that. So there's a whole new world opening up through Peter's work there. But because he shared it with us, we can start thinking around it. Um, and this sometimes can go even further. So um, we had a couple of volunteers at RIC um, 
who did some excellent work looking at the location of eggs and caterpillars of Kentish Glory on birch in a particular area near Aviemore. And, um, and because they'd done such brilliant um, investigations into this, they ended up being able to produce um, a fantastic report for us that really detailed on this site the height at which the eggs were laid, um, the, the height at which the caterpillars tended to be found feeding, the aspect of the um, locations of the caterpillars and the eggs on particular trees, how dense the stands were, where they were found, all these bits of information, really just through the fact that these volunteers were curious enough to go and look at it, record it wonderfully, and then write it up and share that with us. So the other way in which um, the contributions of the curious can be really powerful is in monitoring the uh, arrival and then spread of species which are not native to the UK. Um, so there's there's a dicranopalpus harvestman on the left there, so that's a, a species which has arrived in the UK, it's a genus, there's a few species now actually um, of that genus that are appearing. It's got a really distinctive way of sitting with its legs sticking out to each side and then these big um, palps at the front that are split. Um, so it's through the records of um, uh, biological recorders that we're, we're being able to pick up the arrival of this species and then the subsequent spread of it through the landscape and and the same is true for things like these freshwater shrimps and and all the um sort of freshwater species that have been introduced to the uk and are spreading so without people submitting when they see these things we're not going to know how quickly and where they're spreading to the obvious example for this is obviously the harlequin ladybird. So this is an, an Asian species ladybird which arrived to the UK and has subsequently spread dramatically um, and is now found all the way up in Scotland, um, all the way up in Shetland, across in Ireland. It's really spread quite significantly. Um, but we wouldn't have been able to track this spread of the species if people who saw the harlequin ladybird weren't sending in their records of it weren't sharing this information with us. And it's through the continued sharing of information that we can keep track of um, how far it's spreading, but also will it start um, to even out? Will it stop appearing at some point, some places? Will some sort of native predator start having an effect on it? So it's, it's the ongoing monitoring and the ongoing submission of records of species that either are common or have become common in a certain place that are important as well. Um, and, and to sort of tie in with that, the two-spotted ladybird is a small, small ladybird species here, which it seems to be going into decline um, as the harlequin is spreading. And the harlequin is known to predate upon the two-spot ladybird. Um, but again, without those records coming in of a baseline of data and then subsequently um, highlighting this decline, this is information we just never would have been able to capture. So just to round off for those who aren't really familiar with biological recording, hopefully I've inspired you to actually um, send in your records and share your observations of things that you um, see and find when you're out and about because it's through sharing these things that we can really be a powerful force together, um, providing all this data for science and conservation. But if you're new to it, um, there are lots of different places that you can submit records. So there's specific surveys like the Harlequin uh, Harlequin ladybird survey here um, and you can find all of these by just searching on the internet so it gives you contacts and it, um, it gives you websites and so on so there's things like iRecord which is um, a website but there's also an app as well um, and you can record on the general recording sheet more or less anything and and if you attach a photograph then it allows the verifiers so these are experts to look through what you've said you found take a look at your photograph and decide whether you were right or not and then that can get submitted and go on towards um, all sorts of things like atlases state of nature reports all those sorts of things um, there's also specific forms on iRecord which are really important to bear in mind and make use of. So this is one the British Dragonfly Society has for dragonfly records. It includes things like Exuvia, which is really important, but also includes this box at the bottom, which is if you've recorded all the species on your visit. So you go to a pond, you record everything, and if you don't tick that box, say if you don't see a blue-tailed damselfly, if you don't tick that box, we don't know, or BDS don't know, if you've not ticked that box, um, whether you've not recorded blue-tailed damselfly because it wasn't there or because it's just so common you just didn't bother recording it. Um, but if you do tick it, then we know that you didn't see it there um, and not just that you did see it but didn't record it. And there's a distinct difference there because once we know exactly what it is you did and didn't see it at a site, we can start producing much more accurate trend data.
And then finally, um, organisations like Butterfly Conservation are really organised and have a list of um, vice county recorders for um, moths, which you can submit um, Excel sheets or images or, or ad hoc records to. Um, there's a contact for all of those. And, and also they're usually really, really helpful in helping you if you're not quite sure of an identification. And if you aren't sure of identifications, there's other places you can go. Um, social media can be really useful. So this is the UK Hoverflies. Facebook page, which is fantastic. There's lots of really expert people on there who are brilliant at helping with identifications if you're not too sure. It's always good though to have a go first, not just chuck up pictures and hope that everyone's going to tell you what they are. So have a go first because it's more enjoyable and also um, just a lot easier for people who are helping you out. Things like iSpot, again, you can pop things on there and um, people will come and say whether they think you've got the identification right or not. And also the monitoring schemes. So there's monitoring schemes for, for lots of groups within of plants, um, like in fungi, invertebrates, all sorts in the UK. And um, often if you go through on, on the Biological Records Centre site, um, it will give you a contact for who's running the monitoring scheme. And they're all, always really helpful as well with identifications. So basically what I'm trying to say is that um, it's the curious amongst us who go and find these tiny little creatures hidden away, who watch them as they go about their daily lives, who find new information out about them. But in order to, for that to be really powerful, you must send in your records, share your observations, images, sounds, whatever it is, um, to share that with the wider community and also um, make use of these special recording form features because um, they're really helpful in just providing us with more and more and more data that we can do things with. But ultimately, just stay curious and have fun. Thank you very much. Um, if you're interested in the Rare Invertebrates in the Cairngorms project, it's a partnership project between the RSPB Scotland, Cairngorms National Park Authority, Bug Life Scotland, Nature Scott and Butterfly Conservation Scotland. And if you wanted to get involved or find out more about it, um, then this is my email address. Um, there's also our Twitter handle beneath that and our Facebook page as well. So do follow us. We have all sorts of exciting um, information, news and new findings on there. Thank you very much.